But it couldn't fear me A man's empty page Treasures that fade I never let know Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend And God of the mountain It's God of the valley And there's no other place Your mercy and grace Discipleship, um, and I just want to welcome you uh, this morning. And um, I hope you've had a restful morning, a relaxing morning. I know for my family, it's not always that case. 
we're normally chasing our kids around. So uh, we want to give you an extra 60 seconds to go grab your Bibles, top off your coffee, and we'll see you back in a moment. Me down, build me up again. Kevin on earth. Like Kevin on earth. Help me move when I should move. Help me rest when I should rest. Help me give what I should give. All of me, nothing less. Help me speak your grace and truth. Help me fight for those who came. Help me love the way you love. So we want to start the service off by joining our hearts together and praying the Lord's Prayer. Will you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, especially during these extraordinary times. And Father, life is, is challenging and confusing and complicated at times. And we're just thankful. We're thankful for our faith. We're thankful for our community. And, and Father, we ask your blessing today on our friends, on our family, on the service, on Pastor Scott's message. And Father, we're, we're just humbled today and, and so truly thankful. We ask all this in your son's most precious name.
for us today, Lord, that we can just walk in who you are. This morning, we are able to overcome in our own personal lives because Jesus Christ paid a price. And there's a scripture that says that God, Jesus was the mediator between God and man. And none of us would be here today worshiping and, ha and, and uh, having the ability to have salvation and hope if it weren't for that price that Jesus Christ paid. He's the only reason that we can actually be connected to him this morning and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's something to worship about. And I know I say this often, but we're, we don't worship uh, Jesus because everything's going great. <laughs> we worship him because, just because of who he is and because he is God and Lord of our lives. He is in control and we, uh, we need him so desperately more than ever in our lives. So I just, I just ask that in this next song, whatever you're doing, I know sometimes when you're at home, it's just, it's easy to just be listening and not really be in that moment. And I just ask you to maybe stop uh, what you're doing and just focus this next, on this next song and let's just worship together. The words will be on the screen and let's just focus on who he is today and what he wants to do in our lives. I see angels praising your holy name. I sing praises, I sing praises. I give you honor, worthy Jesus. And I see glory falling in this place. Listen to these words this morning. And I see hope restore the healing. Of all diseases, I sing praises, I sing praises, I give you honor, worthy Jesus. We give you praise, all the be honor, you are our God, the word we live for. We give you praise, all of the glory, God. Sing that part again. And we give you praise. All of the honor, you are my God, the one we live for. We give you praise, all of the glory, God. I see glory falling in this place. I see hope restored. I see hope restored, the healing of all diseases.
sing it to him. All of the glory. Lord, you deserve it all this morning. All of the glory. Move in us, Lord. that we have today. We just set this time aside because we know that when your presence shows up in our lives, you can change things. Lord, you can make things happen. You can cause miracles to take place. And without your presence, Lord, we can try. <laughs> we can push and move. And But um, you're the one who sees and knows all. And so I just pray that right now, even at home, that people would just experience your presence right where they're at. Lord, we don't have to be in a building to experience that. Lord, you move in us and you're constantly trying to do that. You're constantly working in our hearts and we're so grateful for that. So just use the rest of this service, Lord, and everything that's said today, everything that's done, let it glorify you and let your presence be a part of it. We thank you so much for being here and using us as vessels today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, for worshiping with us today. Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to Community Life Church. I am Scott Verano, and I'm the, the lead pastor here at Community Life, and... I am Jen Lusher, the care pastor here at Community Life. I, sometimes the lead pastor? Most of the time. <laughs> keeping it straight. <laughs> keeping it humble. Keep, keeping it humble. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to welcome you, and thank you, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, I got to tell you, this conversation is difficult twice. Yeah. It's, it's twice. I, I, um, we... we um, so... Today, just normally in the, in the last few weeks, we've spent and taken this time, this moment in the service to really um, interview different staff members. And today we thought it would be a great opportunity uh, to just talk about what's going on in our nation, to talk about how we feel about that, maybe give us some things to challenge and move ourselves around. And, um, and, and you know, I, I think as, as Jen and I kind of talked about this a little bit, the only way we can frame this is in light of our relationship and our friendship. And uh, three, maybe four years ago when Jen started working at Community Life, uh, God gave me a true gift, uh, gave me the ability to have someone that would be brutally honest with me and, and push and shove and give me the opportunity to ask questions about race and ethnicity that are, frankly, I'll tell you, many of the questions are stupid, right? I mean, like they just come from a place and you just smile and then you clarify and you push. And, and sometimes my administrative assistant, Vicki, will um, come into the office and say, you, you, you guys all right? You guys okay? You guys okay in there? Okay. Um, give, give us 15 minutes yeah, and give, it turns into two hours. Two hours, <laughs> that's right, trying, trying to work through stuff. So, so, you know, not that we wanna cure everything or fix everything, but we wanna have a conversation right. and really bring you into some of our uh, conversations in light of uh, just the brokenness that, that we're experiencing um, in, in, in the world today. And I think maybe, uh, and you, however you want to start the conversation, but I think maybe with the question, how are you feeling? What's your thoughts? What's... Um, I th so 10 years of cross-cultural ministry, serving outside of my uh, race, ethnicity, cultural background, this has been a journey for 10 years. So where I am now, I was not 10 years ago. Um, and then this is it's a great time to apologize to the church that I started with as I was on this journey, Brookview Wesleyan Church in Birmingham. I mean, 
those guys had to hang in uh, when Trayvon and Michael Brown, when all those um, cases were happening. And, and there was a, I, I get the anger because in the outrage, uh, that was when we first really started seeing things on camera. Um, and so now, then I was just angry and had lots of words and lots of thoughts. Now there is more of a, uh, a numbness not a coldness or a lack of compassion, but a, a numbness as to I am not surprised. Uh, because we've talked about it, it seems like to me this is an every summer incident. Uh, when people get out more, cameras are rolling more, the police have more interactions with uh, African American community. And so we see this almost every summer. I, I remember actually thanking the Lord in March for the coronavirus because I said to myself, at least we'll all have to stay in the house so we won't have that regular summer event. I, I thought about that just like sometime this week, like I was grateful for the coronavirus because it was gonna keep us apart. So where I am right now is that I, I've sadly grown to expect it and live most of my life kind of waiting for this. And, and every summer, every season, there's this spark and then there's an explosion um, and we see it. So I'm not surprised, I'm heartbroken, but I'm not surprised. Um, and, and I'm fully aware that this happens all the time. Uh, it's just around these seasons that we catch it on camera. Yeah, and, and, and so like at the beginning of this week, uh, you know, I, I watched the video with George Floyd and just, I, I still have no words. In fact, I, I, I went back, watched it last night and, and sat down with Micah and we talked about it for a little bit and just through tears, I, I just couldn't possibly believe it. But I, I started this week off trying to process, trying to you know, go through that moment and then the rioting begins and then I started texting you and yes. I'm like, help me, right? Like, and so, so to draw you into some of the conversations, like this is where they go. I'm like, Jen, you got to give me some clarity. And, and, and so some of the conversations we've had in the past are, you know, how is your life different than my life? What are some yeah. of your experiences like that I'm so quick to either not understand mm -hmm. or discount? C can you give us a snapshot of what that's like. I know you've done that for me, but, but yeah. tell me about what that's like for you. Yeah, so, and it kind of knowing this question, it gave me a chance to think about it. Um, around Valentine's Day, my son and I, we drove home. It was my mom's first Valentine's Day without my dad. And so we drove home to go visit her. Sean, my husband, is usually with me. And so we were driving home alone. He had to work, or yeah, driving home to my parents. Um, and coming through the city of Milton, shout out to Milton, um, I was pulled over for the first time ever in my entire life. And the officer said that I was speeding in a school zone. It was about 10.45 p.m. Um, it was also, the, I could see the school zone lights beh like behind me by a great distance. And anyone who has ever driven with me or rode with me knows that I drive like a grandma. Like I'm the one that gets honked at coming to church on a Sunday morning by like my elderly brothers and sisters because I'm driving. My father does not drive slow, so See? grandma, so, they don't drive slow so sometimes. So I had this moment where I'm like, he's pulling me over? Like me, what could I have done? Um, and as he's walking up to my car, the first thing that I do is I let down all my windows because Lucas is in the back seat and I want him to know that I have a child in my car. Every window in my car, the forerunner, even the back window rolls down. Every window in my car was rolled down immediately. Um, and as he walked up to me, um, just kind of explaining to me what was going on, right before he got there, I have a shortcut app on my phone and it texts my husband and my sister. It says that I've been pulled over by the police. Here's my location. Um, and it starts to record a video immediately. It dims the lights of my phone and records a video. And after about 15 minutes, that video is uploaded to Dropbox and it sends it to my husband and my sister. And then it starts another video so that there's a constant log of what is happening. These are all things that I have been conditioned to know that I needed to do. Um, additionally, as soon as he walks up, I find myself being very you know, nervous, but very um, apologetic and deferring to authority because I know I have to not cause him to feel uh, any sort of fear from me. So I'm explaining to him, I've, I've not been pulled over before, can you please explain to me what we need to do? Um, and my husband keeps all my documentation above my head. It's a conversation that we've had. Hey, I don't know what I need. You know, because you're getting pulled over all the time. So can you please put it above my head? Um, and so he did, and I told him I'm gonna reach, I explained every action before I did it. I'm gonna reach above my head, 
and get my documentation. I'm going to pull it down, and I'm going to hand it to you. Is that okay, officer? And he said yes. Um, and as he was going through my documentation, he told me one thing was missing. I even had a license up there. But he told me one of the things were missing, and I was assuming that my husband just didn't uh, get the new copy of the insurance. So I said, I'm pretty sure it is in my glove compartment, but I'm going to have to reach over there. And so I'm going to push a button. I'm going to open it. I'm going to pull it down. I mean, step by step, I'm going to reach in. I'm going to pull out a book. I'm going to open that book. There's going to be documentation. I'm going to hand it to you. And he, and he giggled a little bit, but he said, that's fine. Um, and I went through all those steps. But at some point, it. you even said earlier that he thought, he, he said, ma'am, you're awfully yeah, nervous. Yeah, he says, you're awfully nervous. And I said, oh, absolutely, I'm nervous. I'm absolutely nervous. Um, so I handed him that information. You got to keep in mind, I've never had a ticket. I've never been stopped. So he spent a lot of time in the car. Um, and then when he was done, he walked to the back of the car. So based on what I've seen on TV, that's where the weapons are, right, in my mind. That may not be true. Um, but as soon as I saw that, I, I got really fearful. My son said to me, Mama, are the woo-woo going to chase us? The woo-woo are the roo roo roos mm. And I said, oh, Lord, I hope not. And he said, well, Mama, are the woo-woo helicopter going to come? And I said, oh, I hope not, you know. <laughs> um, and he was at the, the back of his car, and, and that was when I really felt fear. I thought, why is he going to the trunk of his car? I mean, I, I, I be, like, really had fear in that moment. He reached into his car, and he pulled out a teddy bear for Lucas. And we actually still have that teddy bear, and we, we named him after the officer. And he, you know, said, slow down when you're moving forward. That was my experience, and, and I recounted that to a white sister in our church a few days later, and she said, wow. I just got pulled over for running a stop sign here in Tiger Point, and I mean, I had an attitude with the officer the whole time. He came up to my car, and I said, just go ahead and give me the ticket. I know what I did, you know, and then he gave him the ticket, and she said she was just huffy and puffy with him, and it really opened her eyes to how I experienced a police stop, and it opened my eyes again to how she experiences it. Uh, it, was just, it was just this really humbling moment. Um, I think about my nephew, Cooper, who is, uh, unfortunately in, for him, he's been sort of marooned with us here during the quarantine. They came for spring break and haven't been able <laughs> to fly stay. back to Arizona. And I've been very intentional in my neighborhood to make sure all my neighbors who know who he is as an African-American boy, that they know his name, that they know that he's my nephew. When he rides around the neighborhood with the kids in our neighborhood, I tell them, hey, do not go into anybody's lawn. Do not draw attention to yourself. Go ride the bike and come right back and check in on us. And my sister and I hate that we have to have those conversations with him. But it's a reality. We want to protect my nephews. We want to protect my son. But we also know that we have a responsibility to, to tell them the truth. And that's difficult. Um, and, and that is our reality. And, so, and, and, and it's, it's hard to see the look on Cooper's face when we have to tell him why we have to tell him this. But our neighbors... Uh, parents do not have to tell them. Um, and it's something as simple as a few months ago, my son was playing with a child in our neighborhood and that child had guns and they were shooting um, monsters or bad guys. And I had to go to my neighbor and say, Lucas is not allowed to play with toy guns. Like it, it's cute now because he's three, but if he turns eight, it could be deadly for him. And my neighbor was just shocked and she was so apologetic because she didn't realize that when we go to Walmart, now that they're, they're selling toy guns again, they're really cool, they go pow pow. And I have to explain to Lucas, you can't have a toy gun. Like that's just not our reality in this world. Um, and, and, and there are people here who understand, I forget what the event was, but a few uh, months ago, Barbara Rance, who teaches one of our Bible studies, she came into my office and she said, I saw your Facebook post or, or I saw this on Facebook and I do not understand. Can you explain it to me? Right. You know, and that was that was a moment for me that really helped to say to help me to see like stories matter. Stories are important. And for those who are willing to listen, it really can open up our eyes. Yeah, and, and so, I, you know, in, in these conversations and, and, and once again, I think the best way to frame this is these are conversations that you and I always yeah. have, because uh, there are many times where um, you, you'll be saying something to me and I have to remind myself to shut up. <laughs> And listen, right? And, and, and there have been times when I'm saying, well, Jen, that, that's just in your mind. Like, that's just something that you right. made up. And, that, and I re, I've realized over how many ever years it's been that that's the reality that you live in. Yeah. And then we see what happened on TV this beginning part of this week. And, and I go, huh. Yeah. You know, and welcome to the party, Scott. You know, yeah. like maybe this has, is something going on here. And not that I've been that ignorant to the whole thing, but just I, I think it, it, shock, it shocks me to my core. And, and that's why I think this is so important that, that it's easy. There's a defensive nature uh, that I, 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 don't, I don't even know what to say about it, right? Like even listening to you talk, my, my internal gut tries to defend so many different ways right. and I have to fight to listen. Right. And, and I know that that's part of the, that's part of the conversation today. Um, 
what would you say, like one of my sorry responses, and this would have been early on, and I would have meant this with all of my heart, right? Like if mm-hmm. I was to say to you, listen, Jen, I, I don't see color. Right. I have so many friends that are African-American. In fact, and we laugh about this, but I had that 23andMe test done, right? Mm-hmm. And when it came back, I opened it up and I discovered that I am, it's, it's not 1%, it's like less than 1% of African descent. And you know, the first person that I called was you. And I said, Jen, <laughs> I now understand why we get along so well. And yeah. I try to claim that, le- yeah. even and though the other 99.9% is not. No. And I told you, Jamie had you beat because she's 3%. Jamie's got 3%, so right? So I'm, you. I'm working, but, but I, so 10, I, 10%. 10%. 10%. Oh, okay. So when, so when I say I don't see color, what, what does that say to you? What do you hear when you, you say it? Give me a, reframe that for me. As someone who's been doing cross-cultural work, I'll be honest with you, before Michael Brown and Trayvon and all those incidents, it was called racial reconciliation work. Uh, we've come to realize that racial reconciliation is pretty difficult without repentance and some serious things. Uh, but in 10 years of doing cross-cultural work, I've heard that a lot. And the, the first thing that it says to me is this person is well-intentioned, They do not have evil or malice in their heart, but they haven't started the work yet. Um, And that work is what it means to really live into and build relationships with people outside of your culture. Um, To say that you don't see color, unless you are literally, truly, really medically diagnosed as colorblind, is a false premise. Uh, The the beauty of what God has done and our different shades and hues of skin and the melanin and all those things is that it shows the beauty of creation. He, it is his handiwork on display. When you look at a rainbow and you say, oh, a rainbow's just red. We know that that's not true. You can see the colors in the rainbow and the blues and the reds and and that is what makes it beautiful. Just as it is with the rainbow, so also it is in our, our ethnic makeup. There is something beautiful about different colors of skin. And instead of acknowledging or pretending as if you don't see them, and what you're saying is, I don't see a difference in people, then just say that. I don't see you as different than me, even though your skin is brown. Acknowledge it and live into it, because the thing about my brown skin that God gave to me is that there's something about my story that it kind of aligns with and goes with, and it all meshes together, and it's all important. And and the big, real truth thing is, it's not just me saying it. Uh, Paul reminds us over and over again, even though he is the writer that says, now, therefore, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free. He also says, and reminds us over and over that I was a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. If he never lets us forget his ethnic makeup, it's a constant reminder as to who he is. And more importantly, in Revelation 7, we see that the Apostle Apostle John says that when he looked out over heaven, he saw a number that no Mm -hmm. man can number from every tribe, language, tongue, creed, everything. So there's something about your Red, red, whiteness. <laughs> you gonna say reds? Yeah, I got you. <laughs> Tanness. About my one percent. Uh huh. Uh-huh. There's something about this brownness and and the different browns that we're going to carry with us in some glorified form into eternity. Mm-hmm. So if you don't acknowledge it now, what are you gonna do when you get to heaven? Oh, oh, whoops. I never saw it because yeah. you can't tell a lie in heaven, right? right? So that's then right. you're gonna say, okay, never mind, I didn't oh, see that's it, right. right? So, but ultimately, there's something that will endure about what we see, maybe in a glorified form. But when John looks out, that's what he's that that leads me to believe that God doesn't want us to s- d- dismiss this under good intentions. Right. He wants us to acknowledge it and to lean into it and then to begin to form relationships from it. Uh, it's, it again, it's, it's well-intentioned, and I get it. I get what you're trying to say, but it does a disservice to what God is doing when he makes us in his image in different colors. So, so, te- so all right, that, and that kind of just leads into that next thought, like what, what do... what and you've suggested this to me in my life, and you, I know you suggest this to other people who are struggling that will text you and say, what do I say? What, what's the answer? How do you put that together? Like, what, right. how, what can we do in our lives that can help us? Yeah. A uh, dear brother said to me this morning, he said, the one thing I can encourage is understanding. You, before we can do anything, we need to take the time to try to understand. Well, here's the difficulty. If everybody around me looks like me, thinks like me, watches what I watch, like all of y'all watch that Tiger King, the King of the Tigers. Oh, no. Yes, huh? I didn't watch that, right? But all of you guys are watching that. So if everybody around you has the same political views and looks like you and thinks like you and comes from the same cultural background, how will you ever gain understanding right. from different viewpoints? You have to diversify the circle of life, those people that you're sharing life with. And that's beyond your workplace and your workspace. This is in the comforts of your home, post or pre-quarantine, how you diversify your dinner table. Uh, 
I know for a fact it is impossible to hate someone that you are coveted to pray with. Amen. If you've got to pray with someone for them, for their family, the thing about the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ is he can't leave us the same. Mm. He is constantly refining us into the image of his son. Therefore, if there's something inside of you that's not like his son, if you love the Lord, he's going to have to out. refine that out if you work it out. And so if there's something inside of you that keeps you from being able to understand, when you start joining your hearts with other believers from different walks of life, from different colors, from different perspectives, from different nationalities, he's going to start working something in you. Uh, ignorance gets to live in homogeny. Homogeny is when everybody around you looks just like you. It lives in there. It breeds in there. Once you get outside of that, you can acknowledge that taking the life of someone else is not God's intent. Mm -mm. You can acknowledge that um, the responses to that, the anger that manifests itself in a riot is maybe not God's intention, but there's something behind it. Right. Help me. That's what your reach out was. Your reach out, you, you get that, that murder is wrong. Your reach out was the riots. What, what, what is that, right? And you had the space and the place and the relationship to be able to do that. My heart breaks for those of us who don't, right? because now you're just left in this world where it's just you. Um, and, and the really hard part is a lot of people can walk away from this and say, oh, I'm good. But we all have work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, even me, as I'm still going through this journey, I may not be so quick to be angered, um, but, but there are days where I can just really, really, really wallow in the reality of, of, of some of the things that I face. And so we all have work to do, no matter where you are on the journey. And my encouragement is to start having conversations and start looking into your heart and start looking around the room and say, who is in the room with me? Um, and, and, and poor you, I challenge you all the time. Like, who's in the rooms of the decision-making of the church? A absolutely. You know, we had a vision meeting, and everybody in that room sort of looked alike, came from, and I just, I think I lost it. it you, you helped me through it. But I kind of lost it in a public way because I, I think it's important that we be intentional in, in order to gain understanding, in order to be able to have true empathy, and in order to be able to love our brothers and sisters, which is what God's called us to. And the bigger thing is that we can't control what's going on in the world. Mm. We can't. When, the wor when, the, when lost people act lost, we shouldn't be surprised. What we can speak into is how believers behave. Absolutely. And what God is calling the church to is unity. Not an appearance of unity where we don't talk about the issues. True unity where we're working through our issues so that when the world comes in like a flood, like it is doing right now, the church can hold up a standard against it. Where we say it is absolutely true that we have failed in these areas but we're trying our best to work it out. And if the church can't come to an understanding about race and differences and anger that comes from violence, no matter what that looks like, how are we ever going to be the, the light of the world uh, to, to a lost world? We have the hope of the gospel, and the hope of the gospel is that Jesus came, he called us to repent, he called us to believe, and we have eternal life because of that. Right. Hmm. That's the kind of lead pastor kind of talk right it there. Is. That was good. That's it how is. you do that. I accept that. the job. <laughs> you take it. You get the parking spot, which is out <laughs> back in the back 40 back there. We'll pick you up, though, in the red golf cart. I'll take so, it. What, so, you know, it's uh, Holy Ghost Sunday, mm -hmm. right? It's the day of, of uh, Pentecost. But, what, but before we kind of close this out in prayer, any, any thoughts? Yeah. Right? I mean, just what, what you want to go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I am hoping that we, that the Holy Spirit would fall in a new, the, the fresh ray. Right now, where we are in this world, the only answer is Jesus. And that's super easy. Uh, but, but asking Jesus to show us what's in our hearts, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal it. If you never ask, hmm. I mean, some people say he's a gentleman. Me, me and him, our relationship is a little bit different. He's like a football <laughs> player, like a lot of offensive lineman or defensive lineman. Yeah. Um, and I'm the, the, the poor quarterback there. But um, it, he's a gentleman, I guess. And so he's not going to just push his way in. Um, even when we see with Jonah, like God has a, a purpose and a plan, but Jonah chooses to not be obedient to it. And he has to walk through hard things. Right. We're walking through hard things right now because we've chosen not to be obedient to it. Historically, not just this week, not just 10 years ago, historically, the church has some culpability in where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And so for me as Pentecost Sunday, like just asking the Holy Spirit, like help us, help us. But if we don't ask him because we don't believe anything's wrong and the issue is with them over there, we're going to end up in the belly of a whale, mm. you know? And I, and I don't think that maybe we're in there now. And so I don't, I don't have probably sufficient words. I, I just think that there's culpability and there's things that we have to repent of 
And that's when the Holy Spirit starts working. Okay, we got to start right here. Yeah. Lord, let there be a revival and let it begin in me. Mm -hmm. You know, let there be a revival and let it begin in me. I heard that so many times growing up in a church, and it's so true. Thank you. Thank you. You're awesome. Vicki didn't have to break it up. She did not, but she's probably at but home. But she's probably like, watching oh going, gosh. oh, y'all said, yeah. We didn't yeah. raise our voices. We didn't raise That's our voices. We did good. In. That's yeah. right. Can, can you um, pray us out of this kind of thought and section? I can. All right. Um, most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we are so grateful for this time together. Um, we acknowledge that the world is broken, and, and maybe it's always been broken, and we just don't see it um, like we do right now. I believe, God, that this is a season of uncovering. Um, you're trying to get our attention. And, God, we pray that our attention would be given to you. Specifically, we understand that the world is broken, and it's a lost place, and it's hopeless. But the church is the light of the world. The body of Christ um, is the means by which love and grace and mercy and compassion and empathy and justice is called for and spread. And we pray, God, that you would help us to be your church. Help us to find unity, not just the guise of unity, a semblance of unity, but actual unity that comes from sharing our lives together, sharing our stories, repenting, uh, being slow to blame, quick to listen, those who are uh, quick to forgive and, and not taking offense to everything, God. And we pray for hearts that are hurting, whether it be because of injustice or whether it be because of uh, damage done to them because of uh, riots and things like that, God. We pray for them. And we know that no matter where people are in this journey, whether they're just starting it or not sure of any issues in their lives or whether they're currently in the streets right now demanding justice, if they're your children, you are going to take them through the process of becoming more and more like your son. And we pray, God, that your spirit would fall on them, that, that, that everyone would realize no one is outside of the love of God. Everyone is made in the image of God. And because of that, you have a plan for each of our lives, God. Uh, personally, where I have been slow um, to show compassion to others, I repent. Um, where I have been slow to forgive others, I repent. And I ask you, God, that you would help uh, those in this community and those watching to also be quick to repent so that you can do the work that you have to do. We're grateful for your grace. We're grateful for your son's sacrifice. It's because of him we can have unity. It's because of him we can live into the promises of what it means to be in your kingdom, even now. And we pray, God, that uh, you would just work in our midst, that you would comfort our hearts, that you would convict our hearts, and that through this, your church would become a light. And we believe that it's possible. We pray that your spirit would fall in new and fresh ways on each of us, um, and that, that what you are doing, you will do it through your church. We're asking you to use us, God, and we pray that you would. We ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jen. Well, good morning. I appreciate uh, Jen uh, taking time to, to have that conversation and to be willing to um, maybe talk about some of the things that we talk about. She could be brutal, y'all. I'm just going to tell you right now. That, and, and I deserve every single bit of it. And she gives me permission to, to push and shove and be stupid and, and all those things. And, and I just so appreciate God, God allowing me to grow inside this journey. Um, and so... I do want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining us today at, at Community Life Church. My name is Scott Verano, and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and it is an honor to have you here with us today. At Community Life, we love God, we love our neighbor, and we believe that our mission is to connect people to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the source of life. And when you have the source of life, you want every single person you know uh, to know about it. And so that's, that's hopefully what we do in our ministry. That's hopefully where we put all of our resource and if there's anything that we can do for you, please let us know. And, and one of the things that I think Jen and I forgot to say is, is if the conversation that we just had stirs up some challenging things for you, or you need to be a part of a bigger conversation, or you need someone to talk to, please reach out to us. We would love uh, to be in that conversation or connect you with somebody who can, can help you in that. A um, couple quick announcements, and then I'm going to just, I'm going to preach this message so, so fast. It's going to be amazing. 
Uh, the first thing is, is Vacation Bible School. Uh, so it breaks my heart to let you know that after going through many, many different iterations and trying to figure out how to take the most exciting, amazing event and make it digital for you to have to run your kids through for five days, and we realize it's just not possible. Some things are not intended to be digital events. And uh, it would end up being you in the last week of June trying to figure out how to entertain your children online for uh, five hours. And we figured you probably didn't need that. And there were other ways that we could better connect with you. So uh, we're not going to have Vacation Bible School at the end of June. Uh, I hear that Kristen is trying to think about another way a little bit later on in the year to do something with the, with the children just to kind of help them um, since, since we're just kind of missing that whole thing. And so uh, please hear me. We're, we're we're sorry for that, but I just don't, don't think it would be uh, one of the best things that we did. And, and so we'll just, just give you back that time. Uh, the other thing is that tomorrow we'll have our, our Feed Florida food program that uh, starts at nine o'clock. And so if you are in need of resource, you're in need of food, show up here at the church nine o'clock tomorrow, back on the loop road, we'll get you through the, through the line and get you a box of food. And uh, just look forward to serving the community in that way as well. Um, and that's, like I said, that starts at nine o'clock tomorrow. Now, we are in this series called Castaway, and this is the story of Jonah. And uh, for the last uh, two weeks, and then today, the third week, we've just been kind of going through and studying this book, if you will, of the prophet, this prophetic book from the Old Testament, and what it means to us. And really, in this reading or this studying of this book, we're trying to reclaim it for, for the deep rich meaning that it has. When you hear Jonah, you immediately think whale and our mind stops right there. We go beyond and we, and we miss the whole point of the book, which is that this telling, this book, the story of Jonah is really a story of a God who has an immense heart for creation, an immense heart for humanity. And we, our hearts are not always congruent with that and how God takes that immense heart and tries to bring Jonah along on this journey where he gets the opportunity to open his heart to a people that he thinks are just deplorable. Uh, and, and, and that's the, the back and forth inside of this message that goes through. But really the big takeaway is how God is trying to give us his heart for humanity. And so it's about human nature. Uh, it's the struggles that we go through. And there are really two things you need to know as I kind of set this up. And then I'm not going to go through the full recap. I'm just going to jump into chapter three. But you need to know about Jonah. Jonah is a prophet of the Lord. Um, he, he lives in, in, in the, and works in the northern kingdom under, kingdom, uh, under King Jeroboam II. Uh, God asks him to go to the city of Nineveh uh, to deliver a prophetic word to them, a prophetic word of judgment that God in 40 days was going to destroy them. And, um, and you would think when I tell you in a second about Nineveh that Jonah would be excited about this, right? So God tells him to go and deliver this word of judgment to Nineveh. But what you don't know is that Nineveh is a, is a city in the Assyrian empire and it's a, it's a city full of, of corrupt individuals who are the mortal enemies of, of uh, Israel, uh, literally, that they believe in child sacrifice, that they, as they go across and they conquer different cities, that they rape and they steal and they just destroy everything in their path. They're responsible for, for blotting off the face of this earth, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so these are not good people. Uh, they're evil people. And as God surveyed the land, their unrighteousness rises up before him and he knows he's got to do something about it. And so he sends Jonah. You would think, great, this is a wonderful part of the message. What you don't realize is that when God sends a prophet into a place to speak a word of judgment, the prophets have this awareness of the way that God introduced himself to Moses. And the way that, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, that God introduces himself to Moses as being a merciful God, a tender God, a God that is willing to relent, quick to relent. Jonah knows that, and he does not want Nineveh to have the opportunity to repent, and so he runs from God. Chapter one, we discover what it's like in our lives when we run from God and the calamity that we experience, and maybe the big message there was, was, was to, to be aware of how hurtful that is to people, but the God that loves Nineveh is also the God that loves the runner, and God uses that calamity in our lives not to pay us back, but to bring us back. Chapter two, Jonah's thrown off of the ship that he was using to run away from God. He's swallowed up by a giant fish. He prays out to God, he cries out to God, and we discover the length of God's ear, how he's able to hear wherever Jonah finds himself. And it's in that moment that he discovers the true heart of God uh, for even him. 
in that moment. And, and, I, and I think the biggest thing for me to say was that when Jonah cries out to God to be rescued, um, God didn't just reach down out of heaven and pluck him out. God provided a fish. When we cry out in our lives for God to save us from years and years and years of dysfunction, um, we need to know that oftentimes God uses the current situation and problem situation that we're in to get us to the appropriate destination that we need to be in in life. Some of us need to spend three days in the belly of a whale to learn the lesson that God is trying to teach us. Which brings us right to Jonah 3. And so now at Jonah chapter 2 ended with, with Jonah being vomited or thrown up onto the shore. And, um, and, and here we look at chapter 3, and I'm going to tell you just before I read that this chapter to me in the Old Testament should be the most well-known chapter of all of the Old Testament because it speaks of the grace and the mercy of God. There is literally an outpouring of God's spirit and 120,000 of the worst people on the planet repent and turn their hearts back to God. Why isn't the book of Jonah known for that? Right, like I think there's something so much, so evil about our human nature or so subversive about our human nature that, that we can't celebrate the repentance of our enemies. And so therefore it just becomes a footnote or a chapter as opposed to something that is just larger than life. This celebrates the heart of God. If 120,000 people in Santa Rosa County, a, a county of 190,000 people repented and turned their hearts to God, it would make national news. It'd be something that people didn't understand, but yet it, the story's all about a fish. So I'm just telling you there's, there's more to it. There's more to it. So let's just jump in. I'm going to read through this quickly. I'm going to tell you now the service is going to go a little bit over, but I, I promise you uh, it'll be worth your while if you can hang on uh, to the end of this. So Jonah chapter three, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, the great city and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. And so I, I try to think of Jonah, what it's like to be thrown up on the shore uh, from a, this giant fish. And, and I can imagine Jonah, if I was Jonah, sitting up and looking around saying, please, God, let this be Tarshish, right? Like maybe God found someone else to go deliver this message, but he didn't. The first words out of God's mouth in verse two, get up. To me, this is so powerful because this is twice in four chapters or th really three chapters that Noah, uh, that, excuse me, that Jonah has had to been to told to get up once by the, the pagan uh, sailors or the captain and now by God. This tells you how... Um, adverse he is to going and doing and delivering this word that God has given him. Now God is telling him to get up and go to Nineveh. So twice he's been told to give up. Jonah didn't even want to get up himself. Verse three. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. A three days walk across, like that blows my mind. And I know how slow I walk and I try to think of what that's like. And so I wanted to go back and figure out in context what this must have looked like. And I think it's important to remember that inside this book of Jonah, that there's a lot of hyperbole. There's a lot of, of, um, of ex expanding or um, exaggerating to try and make a greater truth. And, and so the city's not as big maybe as what he's saying, that he's trying to get you to understand that this was a, a large endeavor. But when you study the, uh, the city of Nineveh in antiquity, that the city was roughly seven and a half miles around. There was an actual wall that was built around the city, seven and a half miles. This wall, which is absolutely incredible, um, was known in some areas to be up to 148 feet wide. This is what surrounded the city. And we know from chapter four that there's 120,000 people that are there. So whether they lived inside the wall or outside the wall, this was a large place. Now you may say, Scott, where is this city located in terms of our geography today? Nineveh is located in northern Iraq. It's located on the east bank of the Tigris River, and it's surrounded by the city of Mosul um, there in Iraq. And if you remember back when, when ISIS was fighting all of those battles that they had set down in this city, and much of the destruction that they were allowing to happen was to these city walls or gates inside of Nineveh. And so much of that cultural heritage was lost in some of these battles. But that gives you a picture of the modern day um, Nineveh and, and where it's located. And so now we, we have this picture, this place he's gonna walk across. He starts the walking and Jonah is about to lean into this new prophetic moment in his life. He's gonna deliver this word of the Lord. Verse four, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk and he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 
Jonah didn't go in there and start preaching all kinds of amazing, profound messages. Some people say, Scott, there had to be more to the message than just these words. I'm going to tell you in chapter four, we find out that he wanted to do as little as possible because he did not want to see these people change. And so he just basically lived into the the common obedience of doing exactly what he was told to do. And let me go ahead and go a step further. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. If you look at that in the Hebrew, it's only five total days words, five total words that he delivers inside of this. Um, so, so that's what he goes and does. He doesn't mention Nineveh's sin. He doesn't mention how they respond. He doesn't even mention God in this message that he, that he gives to them. And then the unlikely event happens in verse five, something so profound. It says, and the people of Nineveh believed, uh, believe God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. Like you can imagine um, Jonah, what? Like, no, what are you doing? Like, you can't believe what I'm saying. I just want to tell you what's going to take place. Keep doing what you're doing. But they start to believe and they declare a fast based on these five words. Now, in, in my, uh, my, my Bible study on Wednesday morning, the guys like to get into specific words and questions. And, and so they ask Scott, what does it look like when, when it says Nineveh believed? Uh, Nineveh believed God. Does it mean they believed in God or they believed what God had to say? Does that mean something more than, than what's there? And so I dug in this week and started to study. And this word believed is, is this Hebrew word aman, and it means uh, to go beyond just an intellectual ascent. It's a belief that goes beyond that, whatever that means for you. It's used throughout the, um, the Hebrew text. The two things that jumped out to me, uh, Genesis 15, 6, This is where Abraham, God is reminding Abram, later to be known as Abraham, of the promise that he made with him. And Abram decides and chooses to believe or amon what it is that God's saying. And it was credited to him as righteousness. It's the same wording. It's the same belief. It's exactly how it was written. Um, Exodus 14, 31. This is as the Israelites go through the Red Sea and they get on the other side after crossing on dry ground. And the sea closes in and wipes out Pharaoh's army. It says that the Israelites turned around, looked, saw what God had done, and they believed, they aman. So it, it, it's that it, they see the awareness and their hearts are drawn to what's, what's taking place and they believe in God. And, and so whether you believe that that is just for the moment or for whatever, there is that, that connecting to the heart of God, what happens. But regardless, they repent and they turn away from their wickedness. Um, so many biblical scholars point to what's going on around Nineveh during the time, that for some reason, that, that maybe the city was prepared for this repentance that was going to happen. Um, many people cite that there was an army that was pressing in on them, that they had experienced uh, plagues and droughts and all sorts of things. And so being a people that would have read the times would have probably thought that judgment was coming. And so they might have been ripe to hear this word of God and to receive what it was that was God was saying. But regardless, they repent. Verse six, and I'm, I'm gonna try and go faster here. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne and removed his robe covered himself with sackcloth and sat in the ashes. So interesting to me, no one had to tell the king to get up. You think of Jonah. This king got, this is a big deal. The king gets up, puts on sackcloth to show mourning and he repents and he goes and he sits down in the ashes. And then he makes this decree in verse seven. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and of his nobles, no human being or animal, isn't that interesting? No herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Even the animals have to, have to repent. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth. That means even the animals had that, that cloth put on them. And they shall cry mightily to God and shall turn from their evil ways and from, their, and from the violence that is in their hands. And so we see this repentance. And, and you know, for me, back to that hyperbole or back to that um, exaggeration, if you will, this is saying that Nineveh was so willing to repent that even the animals, every single part of their culture was willing to repent. Then we get to verse nine. This was a a wide open experience for me. The king says, who knows? God may relent and change his mind and he may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. I thought, well, that's weird. They're gonna do all of this on the off chance that maybe something's gonna happen. And as I looked up that phrase, who knows? One of the places that I found it was in Joel chapter two, verse 14. And this is the prophet Joel speaking to Israel, calling them to repentance. His great phrase is, rend your hearts and not your clothing. In other words, whatever you're doing with your clothing, I know that's symbolic, but you need to let it happen to your hearts. And then he quotes Exodus 34, 6, which we're going to talk about next week, 
where God introduces himself to Moses as the one that's gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and relents from punishing. And Joel says, who knows? If you do all of this, maybe he'll relent because that's the type of God that he says he is. And so the king is making a decision. Some people say, Scott, (coughs) excuse me. Some people say, Scott, he says, who knows? Does he really even know the decision that he's making? Does he, does he really, he's just kind of guessing, he's trying out there. And I'm going to tell you, many of us make decisions in our faith based on fear of what may happen. Many of the altar calls that we've heard or that we've experienced in our lives call us to consider our eternity and maybe we repent in light of fear or concern for what eternity looks like. These guys are making decisions based on their own self-preservation and the judgment that they hear coming. How can that be anything less than, than what maybe we experience in our lives today? When it moves into verse 10. And this is the theological lightning rod, if you will. It says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind. Some of your texts say God repented. Some say God relented. Uh, But God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. He did not do it. And, And you know, all week long, pushing and shoving and, and trying to have conversation about God changing in this moment or changing his mind. And how could God be so feckless that when somebody does something different, that it's going to change the mind of God? And here's how I've had to place this in my conversation. If what God says in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 is true, that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and relents from punishing, when God chooses to shift his motivation or change what he's doing right here, then it actually, to me, confirms the nature of God. It doesn't change God at all. It confirms the nature of God that when we repent, that when we turn from our wickedness, that there is a very nature of God that relents and turns to us in his compassion and his desire to love us. Now, in this message, and, and, and that to me, so it actually bears out the nature of God. <clears throat> well, it's going to be a problem with my throat. I'm, I'm sorry. The other theological sidestep, and I'll, I'll throw this out there and then I'll close with my, my just two real quick points, is there's a dual meaning to the message that, that um, Jonah speaks when he says 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. That word overthrown in the Hebrew has two meanings. Um, it can also be understood to say it'll be overturned. And, and so maybe you can understand this to be said Uh, 40 days more and Nineveh will overturn or their hearts will change or something symbolic is going to happen there. And so whether, whether it was the judgment or whether it was overturning of their hearts, you see the word of God come true in this particular story. Maybe that's a cop out. I I think the former is, is more true that it's more in God's nature and God's concern that when he sees broken people repent and turn their hearts to him, then he relents. and, And there's a, there's a greater connection and a greater awareness that happens. And so you say to me, Scott, uh, what do I do with this? Like, what's my understanding on this? And, and I just want to quickly run down this thought. But if just for a moment we take, and this is dangerous, the moral high road, be careful when you get on the moral high road, and we understand, and this is true, that we are a sent people and that we are the ones to deliver the message uh, of, of judgment or we are to deliver the, the, the call of repentance to another world and we carry that message. I'm going to tell you, there have been many times in my life when God has given me that word to deliver to somebody or, or to caution somebody, and I felt inadequate to, to do that. Maybe I didn't feel like I was eloquent enough to be able to share those words or, or, or say, rest assured, there's no way that they're going to hear me in my imperfection. Please understand and hear me say this. Jonah's power to preach doesn't come from Jonah. Jonah's power to preach comes from God. And on this day of Pentecost, it's very important for us to realize that when you deliver the word of the Lord, the result is not dependent on you and your ability to articulate or to say or to look good enough or to do all of the right things. When we preach the gospel, when we connect people to Jesus, the gospel message is not dependent upon you or upon me. It's dependent upon the Holy Spirit doing what only the Holy Spirit can do, and that is to bring transformation. As far as we know, Nineveh only heard five words. And we go through our scriptural history. Moses had a stutter. Abraham had family issues. David had a wandering eye. Paul was a murderer of Christians. Peter was a denier of the faith. Those are not excuses. Those are truth. But God placed, and here's the big thing, God placed an imp- a perfect gospel in the hands of imperfect people. And what I would say is when you share the love of God, that you have to learn to trust the love of God. 
And, and I say that just, just as much for myself uh, today as, as anyone else. And now let's get down off of the moral high road and, and, let, and let's talk about this last point. And this last thought is, is I wonder if in hearing our message today, if maybe we don't need to consider that this message of repentance is for us. That maybe we are the ones that are being called to repentance. And you know, after watching the news and, and watching any of the feeds, and you know, I would love for us just to take and just to set all of the politics and all of the finger pointing aside for just a moment and take control of the only thing maybe that we can absolutely control in this world. And I, don't, I would even argue that, which is ourself in our own decision-making process and to search our hearts and to allow the Holy Spirit to do that very thing inside of us. Because here's one thing I know after watching throughout the entirety of this week and processing, we have got to be better. As believers, as people who claim to be transformed in the light of a God who can rescue entire nations like Nineveh or, or reach out and rescue people who we know are corrupt in their very hearts and deliver to them a word of repentance, if we are people that claimed to be transformed in light of that God, then who are we to throw the first stone? We have got to start out by sifting our hearts and by looking at ourselves and allowing that compassionate God to shape us and to allow this this mission that we talk about, about loving our neighbor, to extend beyond our friends, to extend beyond our neighbor, and try to wrestle through what it means to extend even into the place of loving our enemies. What does that look like when, when, when the incongruency in our heart doesn't line up with what we see inside of the heart of God? We have to allow him to sort us. We have to allow him to bring us to a new place. And so today, as we wrestle through this message, I want you to know that, that in the book of Jonah, the problem wasn't, Gen- wasn't Nineveh. The problem was Jonah and his heart towards the Ninevites. God had to allow him to go through the calamity that he experienced until he could deliver the word. And then even then, he wasn't transformed. It's, it's only our heart and our prayer that says maybe after God continued to work in him, that he understood later the heart that God has for those people. Jen said it earlier, that if God loves us and this gospel is true, he will not leave us where we are. That there's greater work that has to be done inside of our hearts. And maybe today, the call to repentance lies right inside of us. And that we have to be willing to say, Holy Spirit, sift us. Holy Spirit, do the work. And Scott Barino says, let it start right here. And I pray that you'll do that very same thing in your heart. Before we get back to our news feeds and before we get back to responding, let us shut our mouths and let God do the work that's inside of our heart so that when we do respond, we can be informed by what it is that he teaches us and that we can be informed by his heart for, for this world. And then maybe then, we can see this world transformed and thy kingdom come and thy will be done. This is not about one nation under God. This is about one God, one kingdom, and praying for our nation to be transformed in light of the one true kingdom. And that's the cry of my heart. I know we can do better. I know I can do better. I know I can do better. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I love you (laughs) with as much of an imperfect love as I can even say that with, knowing that I I sure don't show it all the time. God, I love you. My heart belongs to you, whatever that means. Lord, and I lean in the direction of transformation today. Help us, God. Help us to be transformed in the light of a God that, that can change this world. So often we proclaim a message that is, that is incongruent with your heart. And today, God, the message about, is about a God who loves this world, the brokenness, the vileness, all of those things. God, you, you, have, you obviously understand all of that, but God, your heart is for those people to be transformed and to repent and turn. And who are we to say anything different except for to start and to search ourselves? Wherever we find ourselves in this story, Lord, we, we begin here. Maybe today I'm Nineveh. Maybe today I'm Jonah. Transform. God, we love you. We need you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite you, if you will, 
to allow yourself to hear the words of this song. Let them speak to you. And, and, and don't be so quick to just run off. J just spend the next few minutes listening to these words. And I believe God has something really special for us. Come out of hiding, you're safe here with me. There's no need to cover what I already see. You've got your reasons, but I hold your peace. You've been on lockdown, but I hold the key. Cause I loved you before you knew it was love. I saw it all, still I chose the cross and you that I was thinking of when I rose from the grave. Now with all the shackles, my victory's yours. I saw the veil for you to come close. There's no reason to stand at a distance anymore. You're not far from home. I'll be your lighthouse when you're lost at sea. Oh, and I will illuminate everything. No need to be frightened by intimacy. So just throw off your fear and come run it to me. Oh, run it to me. Yeah, cause I loved you before. You knew it was love. And I saw it all, still I chose the cross And you were the one that I was thinking of When I rose, rose from the grave Now rid of the shackles, my victory's yours I saw the veil for you to come close There's no reason to stand at a distance anymore You're not far from home. I just want to say thank you for, for allowing us to, to have these conversations today. Um, these are hard conversations, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, thinking about transformation, it's where we have to be. If we're going to be worth anything to this world, that, we have to be transformed. And so, so thank you for being willing to do the work. And I, I pray that, that you are. I pray that we, I pray that I am um, as we begin and could, or I should say continue on this journey. Just, just asking that God leads us and guides us every step of the way. Can you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we, as we go from this place, Lord, allow our perspectives to change. Bring us to a new place. God, help us to, to lean into those conversations, to, to not be quick to respond, but, but God, to listen, to process, to, to, to shove those voices that are so quick to rise to the surface down and, and allow ourselves to process and listen so that we can have a response that maybe is shaped in, in the light of you. I pray for our nation. I pray for the people of our nation that are hurting. God, get us to a better place. Help us to get to a place of, of freedom and hope. And that can only be found in your son, Jesus. So lead us and guide us. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.